What is going on guys, my name is John, and welcome back to yet another video. Throughout the history of the mainline Pokemon games, the concept has been very simple. Get your starter Pokemon and roam around the region battling all the gym leaders in order to collect their respective badges. It's a basic and linear idea, but what if I told you you could do it backwards? Today we're going to find out how easy you can beat Pokemon Red and Blue in reverse. Now I'm sure there are a bunch of questions running through your head, but your immediate reaction to this video is probably, this makes no sense at all. And honestly, I don't blame you. There are a bunch of requirements just to get to the second badge, so how in the world would you even get to the eighth one first? This obviously includes a bunch of weird tricks and planning to throw together, but before I get to explaining how this can be done, let's go over a little information about this. So the actual name for this type of playthrough is called Reverse Badge Acquisition, or the lesser common name is Reverse Badge Order. I stumbled upon this concept all the way back in 2016 while I was watching the Summer Games Done Quick charity livestream for that year. I was immediately hooked to the idea of being able to do something like this, but I figured that an average Pokemon fan like myself wouldn't be able to attempt even something close to this. But I decided a couple weeks ago to learn more about it and give it a go myself. I found out that the world record holder for this category as of the date this video goes up is Jimfreak739, who completed this in a mere 25 minutes and 31 seconds, which is absolutely crazy. Now obviously I'm not a skilled speedrunner, nor do I have enough Gen 1 experience to come even close to a time like that, but I was curious as to how difficult it would be to learn the ins and outs of such a unique playthrough like this one. I want to note before we jump into this wild adventure, I want to bring up a couple things that some people might put in the comments. This speedrun has been heavily optimized over the years, and the way that we're going to be playing through this game is the same way that they did it at SGDQ 2016. Although this seems like a really odd thing to do, the reasoning behind this is that this method doesn't require any frame perfect inputs like the newer routes, and I wanted to make this video as accessible as possible to those who are interested enough in the category to try it out themselves. If you're interested in seeing how it's done now, I've included the current world record video by Jim Freak in the description. I also want to give a shout out to Etiquette for making a video guide on his Twitch channel, which I use to help explain this process a lot better. I highly suggest checking out both of their channels, and I've linked all their stuff in the description below. I also believe that some portions of this method don't work in the 3DS Virtual Console versions of the game, so if you'd like to try this, you're going to have to either play it on the actual cartridge with something like a Game Boy Player, or if you're into emulators, it should work exactly the same. With all that out of the way, let's find out if this is possible. So the game starts out as it normally does, with you meeting Professor Oak, and right from the get-go we have something important that we have to do. We can name our character whatever name that we'd like, however our rival has to have a specific name for all of this to work properly. From now on, our rival will be known as capital RRRG hyphen hyphen. Yeah, it's one of those kind of playthroughs. After we collect the potion from our PC, we can head outside and meet up with Professor Oak and follow the normal process to collect our starter to take on our journey. We're going to choose Bulbasaur as it's arguably the best starter in the game, but it also has a few things that make this run actually work. If we try and exit the building, we have to fight our rival, which is actually going to be the most difficult battle in the entire challenge. Because we're on equal levels and it can use Growl, this battle can take quite a while, but thankfully we have a potion to guarantee us the victory. From here we can head to Viridian City and collect the parcel from the Pokemart, and return to the Professor to receive the Pokedex. At this point we want to head to Pewter City, but there are a couple of tasks that have to be taken care of along the way. The first big thing that we have to do is take a look at our Bulbasaur. If you go into its summary, we can see a bunch of stat information about it, but the one thing that we need to pay attention to is its special stat. This stat can range from 12 to 14 points, and this number can completely change the way you play if you're doing an actual speedrun. At this point in the playthrough, there are two different strategies that you can do. Pidgey strats, or PP strats. Pidgey strats require you to catch a Pidgey for an upcoming event, while PP strats require a specific setup with your moves in order to make everything go the way that it should. Pidgey strats is a faster option to completing this, but there's a chance that it won't work later in the run, and you'll have to resort to using PP strats instead. Because I don't care about my time and just want to be able to pull it off, we're going to follow the PP strats instead. I know this probably doesn't make a ton of sense, but as we progress I'll cover everything that you need to know. Now that we're on Route 1, we have to get our Bulbasaur to exactly level 7. This can be done by battling either a level 4 Rattata, or a couple level 2 and level 3 Pidgey can get you to that amount. This will let Bulbasaur learn the move Leech Seed, which is oddly enough a very important step to this run. As we make our way through Viridian City, it's helpful to grab the hidden potion in this cut tree before making moves to the forest. Although Viridian Forest contains quite a few trainers, there is actually only one mandatory one that needs to be fought, which works out perfectly for the setup we're slowly trying to put together. 
As we're dodging everything else, we can collect the antidote on the ground, as well as the hidden potion that is in the front of the mandatory trainer at the end of the forest. This bug catcher will only have a single Weedle that we have to battle, and this should be an extremely easy battle to win. We still have potions just in case, but it can only deal 3 damage per hit unless it's a crit. And it can't poison you because of our typing, so this shouldn't take too much effort to finish. After this battle, our bubble store should be at level 8, and it's important that we don't level it up any further. If we take a look again at Bulbasaur's stats, we can see all three of its moves. Since we're going to be doing the PP strats method, we're going to need to get Bulbasaur's moves to specific power points, as well as make sure they're in a specific order. Fortunately, we can encounter Metapod and Cocoon in the Viridian Forest, which makes it much easier to use our moves without worrying about our Bulbasaur getting knocked out. The order of our moves have to be Leech Seed with any number of power points, Tackle with 16 PP, and Growl with 36 PP. From here we can head up to Pewter City, which seems like we have reached a dead end. This is the location of the first gym in the game, and since we want to beat it last, how in the world would you even pull that off? For those who don't know, there is a guy that stands to the east of the city, and if you try to walk past him, he'll walk you to the front of the gym. This guy won't leave the spot until you defeat Brock, so this whole challenge is impossible, right? Not exactly. Before we go any further, we have to stop at the Pokemart and purchase a few items. There isn't really anything specific that we need to grab, as we just need to have 6 different items in our bag. I chose to purchase random items, but no matter what, you'll have to purchase an escape rope. This will all make a lot more sense later on. So like I mentioned, the game intentionally makes it so you can't get into Route 3 until you defeat Brock. But there is a slight oversight in this mechanic. If we walk in front of the guide and press B through all of his text boxes, we can press start immediately after he stops talking and open our menu. Now at this point, he's supposed to bring us to the gym, but if we save and then restart, we can see that we're in the same location, but his text has changed to the sentences he uses when he leaves you at the gym. If we hold right, we can walk into Route 3 and progress with the story. Now this is all well and good, but it really only solves one issue. If we progress through this route and Mount Moon, we're only going to get stuck having to face Misty's gym in Cerulean City. So how in the world are we going to go farther than this? Well, if we walk back over to the guide, open up our list of Pokemon, and then talk to him, we can now… walk through walls. This mechanic is called Brock Through Walls, which is not only the greatest name ever for a glitch, but it's extremely useful for a challenge like this. Essentially, when we look at Bulbasaur's stats, the game analyzes that information, as well as our new location on the map, and redetermines the path that the trainer will take you to the gym. This specific setup of moves and power points overflows the lock that the game sets on your movement when you're forced to follow the guide. This results in the character having no collision data in this state, which means that it can walk through basically anything, as long as we don't go too far out of bounds and then crash the game. Now although we can totally go into the 8th gym and take on Giovanni, we only have a level 8 Bulbasaur, so I'm pretty confident we're not going to have an easy time taking him on. Instead, we're going to head south of Cerulean City and head all the way down to the center of Kanto in Saffron City. If we go into the Pokemon Center, we can heal our Bulbasaur, but our walkthrough walls will be disabled, so we're now able to play the game normally. Our next goal is to reach Celadon City, but if you haven't noticed, we're stuck in the place that you're not supposed to go into until later in the game. The guards at the gates of the city won't let you pass until you've given them a drink, so how exactly do you pass them when we can't get one of those in the city? Well, if we talk to him and hold the direction that we want to walk, there's a small window between the text closing and him pushing you in the other direction. This means that we can just skip by him, and he'll forever be parched for the entirety of this run. This isn't something I set up for either, you can actually do this in any copy of the game. Now that we've finessed our way into Celadon City, we're going to want to collect the coin case at the diner. If we go into the game corner, we can pick up 120 coins off the ground, which is conveniently enough to redeem one special prize next door, Abra. Although Abra is too weak to fight against anything, it will always know the move Teleport, which will have a bunch of different uses that we can take care of right now. We can use it to fly back to Saffron City to save some time, but the big use for it is south of the city. If we deposit Bulbasaur and skip this guard, we can access Route 6. If you follow the path, you'll see that there's a trainer located on the far left. Now normally this guy is supposed to walk up to you if you're in his line of sight, but just like the guards, there is a small window where you can make button inputs. If we walk in his line of sight and immediately press start, we can open up our menu. From here we want to teleport back to the Pokemon Center, which may now seem a little bit more familiar. If you ever tried to catch Mew in these games, I basically did the same method, but I just did it in a different location. At this point we're unable to use our menu, and the only way we can fix that is to complete the battle that the game thinks that we're in. If we go to the Saffron Dojo, we can take on this Karate Guy and his Machop. We're obviously going to lose this battle, but this will restore our ability to interact with the world. If we try and head back down to Route 6, we'll be stopped and… we'll encounter Missing No. 
If you know anything about this abomination, you know that it can do some really odd and random things to your game. And the most important thing it can do for us is mess around with our items. If you run from the battle and check our bag, we should now have an oddly numbered amount of escape ropes. This is actually over the 99 limit, so the game tries to represent it with whatever this is. The goal is to get 255 escape ropes, so we're going to have to do the trainer fly glitch again, but it's important to get rid of two escape ropes or it'll mess up the amount that we'll get. Once we've fought the second missing no, we can head into the guardhouse again, and we should have that amount represented by a block and the number 5. In order to really capitalize on this feature, we're going to need to trick the game into thinking that we have less than zero items in our bag. From how I interpreted this process, each item in your bag has a value attached to them, and the cancel button at the end has a value of 255. By setting our escape ropes to that same amount, the game thinks that these are also a cancel button, which leads to some weird results. What we want to do is toss all the regular items above the escape ropes, which will then duplicate those escape ropes that we have. At this point, it thinks we only have 3 items in our bag, so if we throw away all but 3 of the top stack and then merge them into the other escape ropes, the game will then think that we have negative 1 items in our bag. Which then allows us to go under the cancel button and lets us do this. This is called underflow, and believe it or not, most of the stuff here is not just a garbled mess. A lot of this stuff holds value to it. If we take one of our sets of escape ropes, we can now swap it with these master balls, which always have a ton of great uses but some of these items can change settings. If we throw away one of these items in the stack, it will change the text speed of the game. This changes it to instant text, which is the setting over fast, which is only used in a couple scenarios in the actual game. Now let's do some really crazy stuff. If we swap TM27 with this other set of master balls, we can change data values in the game to our advantage. There's a chance that the item below the escape ropes we swapped can be a bunch of random characters, which can cause problems later on. But if we swap it with the Ultra Balls, the screen will completely black out. Oh, no, wait, uh, yeah, there I am. With all that done, if we head up and leave the Saffron City Gate, we'll be... somewhere in Cerulean Cave. Now obviously we're here to catch a special Pokemon, but I wouldn't have the smallest idea what direction to go. So let's make use of our bag again and see what we can do. Now it would take a pretty long time to explain exactly what I'm doing, but essentially I'm moving these items around to change our player's coordinates on the map. If done correctly, we can take one step to the left and instantly encounter Mewtwo. Because we swapped the Master Balls from earlier, we can just use those and add the strongest Pokemon in the game to our team. After the battle, we need to prep a little bit before we start taking on the gyms. Because we're going to be receiving a bunch of TMs for every gym leader that we beat, it's important to throw away the top stack of items seven times, so our items don't get all messed up when they're added to the bag. After that, if we swap some more items around and take one step to the left, you'll notice that the screen will change. If you swap Mewtwo in the first slot, you'll now notice that the gym guide is in the bottom left. That's right, although it looks like a place of nightmares, we've successfully made our way into the Viridian City Gym. We're going to basically do the same thing that we did with Mewtwo, but it's important to use TM37 on Mewtwo, which contains the move Self-Destruct. After moving some more items around, we can close the menu and we'll be face to face with Giovanni. So since we're using a level 70 Mewtwo, it shouldn't come as any surprise that the battles won't be any sort of difficult. Psychic and Swift do plenty of enough damage to defeat every Pokemon in the region, and although we're pretty limited on power points, we have an Aether in the depths of our bag, just in case we end up getting something like a Gen 1 miss. After we defeat Giovanni, if we check our trainer card, we can see that we have the 8th Gym Badge. Pretty crazy. Another thing to note is that although it doesn't look like it, the world is only visually glitched out, and we're actually within the bounds of Viridian Gym, so all we have to do is walk out the door. But if you couldn't tell by now, we're not going to make it that easy. So if we switch around a couple items, we can head outside and we're instantly warped onto Cinnabar Island. Unlike the other areas in the game, this gym is locked until we obtain the secret key from the basement of the Pokemon Mansion. While we're not restricted from doing that, once again there's a special mechanic that we can take advantage of. Within our endless list of items, there should be one called Cancel, and it should have an odd amount of them next to it. When we click on it, it opens up the menu to use it on a Pokemon. If we instead back out into the overworld, we'll now be invisible. Not only that, but we're able to pass through walls, which allows us to bypass the key requirement if we enter the gym from the left of the door. This method is called jacking. Its name comes from the name that you chose for your rival, Jack, which apparently has the same effect as this cancel does on earlier speedrun routes. To explain exactly how this works in layman's terms, there are a specific list of items that allow you to access the party Pokemon menu when you select them from your bag. Great examples of these are healing items, rare candies, or stuff like a moonstone when you want to evolve a Clefairy. 
Because the item cancel isn't registered on this list, the game still thinks that you're in that specific menu, even when you close everything out. Because normally you're not in control of your player when you're in the menus, the game doesn't account for all the things you're not allowed to walk into. There's still plenty of things that you can still thump into, but there are tons of advantages to using this specific item. Once we head through the door, we can take on Blaine. This is another one of those things where you can totally just run through the gym and answer all the questions, but it's definitely a lot cooler to control space and time and summon gym leaders as we please. This battle isn't difficult to do, but if you want to do it a little bit faster, you can use self-destruct on Mewtwo. If we revive him later, his health will be in the red, which will increase attack speed while we're in our battles. After the battle, we claim our second, but also seventh gym badge. If we head a few steps to the right, we can grab this item that's just a bunch of question marks for later. Although we're inside the gym, we can use an escape rope, which will bring us all the way back to Saffron City. If you walk a couple steps to the left, you'll be able to use a bike. This isn't necessary at all, but it's definitely a convenient trick to speed up your run. From here we can head up to Sabrina's gym, but since it's blocked, we're going to have to jack our way past the grunt blocking the door to get inside. After tossing a few master balls to change our warp, we can jack through the wall and skip the whole gym to get to Sabrina. This is probably one of the only gyms that can be a little concerning, but that's really only because there's a 1 in 256 chance that 100% accurate moves can miss. After another extremely easy battle, we can head out the entrance, which will immediately bring us to the Fuchsia City Pokemon Center. Koga's gym is next, and as you'd expect, we can just walk through the walls and battle him directly. After collecting the badge, we're going to head to the building to the right of the gym, as the warp for this house is more convenient to manipulate than the gyms. After tossing a few items, we can walk through the door to Erica's gym. This process is basically the same as the past two, but getting to gym 3 is a lot more interesting. After adjusting our bag, we enter the entrance to SSN, which then leads to Vermilion City. While I believe that we can just jack through the cut tree and access the gym, there is a really neat item that we can use instead. In our bag, we can grab that question mark item from earlier, which is apparently a leftover item that the developers use to test out different parts of the game. If we stand near the water and use the item, it will act as a surfboard, and we can easily swim right to the entrance of the gym. I guess that they just forgot to delete it after experimenting with it, but it's pretty interesting to think about what their original intention was with the item. After taking on Lieutenant Surge, we can take a step outside and walk directly in the front of the Cerulean Gym. This is the last time we're going to use the surfboard, but this does save a little time as there's one mandatory battle that you normally have to do. After collecting your badge, we're going to change our warp in the Pokemon Center, which will then lead us to the entrance of the Pewter City Gym. Apparently the guide found his way out of the mountains, and he firmly reminds us that we're going to have to take on Brock at some point, but thankfully this is the final badge that we need to collect. This gym is obviously a breeze, which means that we've successfully obtained every badge in Pokemon Red and Blue in reverse order. But we didn't technically beat the game, right? I feel like this run would be incomplete if we didn't become the champion. I mean, that's kind of the whole point of the game, right? Well, if we swap our last group of items around, we can head over to the gym statue, and if we walk straight down through the wall, we'll end up at the Hall of Fame. Kinda. And with that, we've successfully beat Pokemon Red and Blue backwards. But how did I do? So let's review. At the end of the Hall of Fame sequence, I finished the entire game in only 1 hour and 15 minutes. Although this is nowhere near the 2531 that Gym Freak set, I'm more impressed that I was able to pull this off on my first try. Granted, this took about an hour and 40 minutes because I had to soft reset over some of my mistakes, but I'm just proud of the fact that I was able to do this whole adventure in itself. It's such a quick and fun category that I'd be really interested in trying to get under an hour sometime in the future. Like I mentioned at the beginning, the newest route is a lot different than this one, but if you're looking to get into learning about this type of run, I've included a ton of info in the description, including a rough outline of all the steps that you need to do it yourself. I'd highly suggest watching this with Etiquette's video in the background just in case, but if you follow along, you'll easily be able to do this around the same time that I was able to. Once again, I want to give a shout out to Etiquette, Jim Freak, as well as a bunch of other creators that worked really hard to make this happen, and I've included all their socials and guides in the description below. If there's someone that I missed, don't hesitate to point them out in the comment section below. Other than that, that's all there is to say about beating Pokemon Red and Blue in reverse. And that's going to do it for today's video. If you liked the video, leave a like and consider subscribing, as I'll be making more content like this very soon. If you have any other suggestions for videos that you'd like to see, leave a comment below. Follow me on Twitter to keep updated with new videos as they come out. Other than that, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.